you were born from? we're doing that, I will introduce Lydia. <laughs> Our um, next speaker is Lydia Murray, who is the CIO for Cook County. <coughs> and uh, you'll hear from her colleague in just a few minutes. Um, she's worked for nearly two decades. That, that's a number I've not been able to use for quite some time. <laughs> I'm in public service and local, um, in helping make local governments uh, run better. She served as CIO of Cook County since September. And at the county, she oversees a team of more than 100 technologists and a capital budget of over $30 million. Prior to joining the county, she was an associate principal at Civic Consulting Alliance, working to create collaboration between the city of Chicago and Cook County. She served two tours of duty as deputy chief of staff to Mayor Richard Daly. I don't know if the tours of duty is a military reference on purpose. <laughs> And the last thing I'll mention is she holds a bachelor's degree in urban studies and political science from the College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio, the town where my parents last lived. <laughs> so, Lydia, thank you. Thank you much. Um, I'm going to be brief because you're going to get to hear from President Preckwinkle. So what I hope to do is just under um, undergird a little bit of what she's going to talk about so you can understand the state um, in Cook County. Um, as you said, I've been there since September. I think this is week eight, so I am relatively new on the ground at Cook County, really trying to get my arms around um, what's going on in technology. Um, I just wanted to, this, this is a framework by the, the lens that everyone is functioning in Cook County right now, what our budget gap is. And so Tony just released a, a budget that is uh, covering the most recent gap, $267 million that we're trying to close for this year. And you can see that it increases as pension debt and other pressures on our budget um, continue to grow. And so uh, Tony has charged me with uh, helping close that gap. Um, and really figuring out how we use technology to be a significant driver of making sure that those lines come together. Um, the challenge that I have is um, we have a lot of blackberries. Um, we, we are not cutting edge um, in terms of technology. And when you sort of look at, um, I think we will keep them in business hopefully for a little bit longer. Um, we are on sort of the, the spectrum of uh, aging technologies. We have a lot of investment. Uh, we primarily use a mainframe to do um, all of our data processing. So when you go to vote uh, in Living Cook County, it will be through a mainframe. When you get your jury duty slip and all the court processing, it is through the mainframe. When you pay your property tax bill, through the mainframe. Um, so we have a, you know, a significant investment in aging technology that we really need to address at the same time we're trying to close that budget gap. So that's sort of the framework, right, that, that um, I get to operate in and that Tony's charged me with both get us higher on that curve and um, save the county a lot of money. Um, the other challenge that we have is that we're in a very, very siloed um, structure. We, have, as I said, you know, technology and applications that were built in the 70s, 70s or 80s. Um, we have mission critical functions that run on, as I said, the, the mainframe and mid-range. Um, we really have a staff that are not, um, uh, they're leg legacy application managers and not project managers or web developers or have um, some of the newer s skill sets. We have five, at least five, I think there's a six, financial systems, I think I found a sixth one last week. Um, that we operate on and try to keep harmonized. Um, we don't have data sharing among different offices in Cook County. There are 11 separately elected officials that um, many of them have their own sort of IT structures that I'm trying to, to get uh, my arms around and understand how those fit into the county. Um, 
We have very vendor-centric projects that are driven by the vendor rather than us driving the vendors to deliver the value that we want. And we don't really have a coherent strategy. So again, this is the framework by which Tony will talk about today what, um, what she is charged with and how we are um, working in Cook County to develop a strategy. So I've, I've started working on a strategy in the first eight weeks that are getting us uh, into more modern technology and into some um, uh, relationships that will bring value and uh, particularly shared services um, to Cook County. So how can we get, um, how can we leapfrog those generations of technology very quickly and do it very economically? Um, one of the, the best ways to do that is to partner with other, particularly other local governments. In fact, there's a city hall that is attached to the county building where they have made investments um, in technology that can be leveraged um, for the county. So where can we reach across uh, the hallway, in fact, and uh, say, hey, you have invested in some technology that, that we do some of the similar things. We both buy stuff. We both have fleets. We both uh, do similar activities. How can we do shared services together? So we're um, really starting to partner with uh, the city of Chicago, um, CPS, CTA, and the state of Illinois to see where, where can we leverage who does best in class and how can we do shared services because it's too expensive for Cook County to invest in these systems on its own. Um, likewise, um, Cook County has made an investment in GIS systems and graphical information systems. We've, we've actually invested quite a bit because we're the folks that collect all the property taxes and we need to know exactly where the parcels are and exactly what you owe us. So we actually do have a lot of investment in mapping and in GIS systems. Um, one of the things that I am uh, that we are working towards is how do we share our GIS tools that we've invested a lot um, in um, and do a shared services down to some of the villages and townships and towns um, in Cook County so that they can, they on their own couldn't afford the GIS systems that the counties build up, how do we share that with a lot of the villages, townships, uh, you know, towns in Cook County? Um, the, the final thing that we're focused on is how to, how do I get the data out of that mainframe uh, um, and put it out on the web so that people can, um, you know, not only we're using it as transaction uh, systems, but how do I get it out on the web? How do I do open data um, and, and transparency with that information? That's really important to to push our data out and our information out that we had sort of locked down in the mainframe. Um, and the, the final piece of sort of pushing technology out is, um, Tony believes strongly, and she's gonna talk about it later, in um, digital economic development. And um, a significant portion of our capital dollars are going to expanding broadband um, in areas in the county that are underserved. And so the first project that we actually got the permits yesterday from the city of Chicago, um, is we are linking a, a very uh, big pipe, uh, dark fiber, to Stroger Hospital. And we're doing that in partnership with the city. Actually, CTA has some extra strands that go a couple blocks from Stroger, and so we are connecting up Stroger to be able to do telemedicine, telehealth, um, some really exciting things. And so to the extent that we can um, make sure that county, uh, county uh, institutions are on high-speed fiber that's going to benefit all residents, so she'll talk a little bit about the broadband. Great. Our next speaker is either a surprise or whoever I can figure out here. <laughs>
Stu Marie is next. Can find her. But I will introduce Maria while we do. I know. <laughs> I'm a computer engineer. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Prison company. <laughs> next speaker, one way or another, will be Maria Thompson, who is the Director of Innovation Strategy at Motorola Solutions. So they are now going to rapidly innovate PowerPoint. But um, she served in many significant roles at Motorola, and includes Director of Legal Operations, Portfolio and Change Management, Director of Intellectual Asset Management, Process, tools at Motorola. Um, she coordinates, plans, and, direct, and facilitates directed innovation, creative problem solving sessions, resulting in high quality and novel and patentable solutions. She um, has many achievements to her credit. Some of them are facilitating over 100 directed innovation ideation workshops, resulting in thousands of patent applications and novel solutions. She has prototyped and tested and deployed a number of seminal methodologies, two of which I use when I teach all the time, um, mind mapping and scenario planning, so I'm very interested in those two. And with any luck, Maria will be there. Well, Maria will be next. I thought she'll have power on slides as well. While we're doing that, I will introduce a subsequent speaker as well. Our, our next or final speaker. speaker will be Michael Kerr, who I've known for some time. He's principal at KPI Strategy Group. He served as senior director in the public sector, state and local government division of Tech America, which is the largest technology um, policy and uh, trade association for technology companies in the U.S. based in Washington, D.C. Tech America was formed by the um, combination of the American Electronics Association, the Cybersecurity Industry Alliance, Information Technology Association of America and the Government Electronics and Information Technology Association. Um, I serve on the board there and I've worked with Michael for a number of years and he was the state and local government expert within Tech, Tech America. And has directed a number of projects. Um, the most recent one was uh, one specifically on cloud computing um, in government applications. And so we're also very happy to have Michael and we'll do this in whatever order works. It's at the bottom, in the bottom yeah, corner. Well, I will uh, Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you uh, <laughs> for the invitation, Jim, and thank you to uh, our attendees today. Very pleased. Okay. Don't roll it. <laughs> I'm uh, pleased to join you to give a just a, a brief overview before we get into some discussion about uh, trends, uh, both in uh, business uh, innovation and technological innovation in the states as I, I saw them from my perch uh, in well, 10 years at, at Tech America, which allowed a, a few across 50 states and many of the largest localities uh, in the country. Um, okay, here it goes. Don't, just, just click it. Oh, no. 
Don't click and roll it. That be a Okay. Oh, these buttons. Okay, gotcha. Sorry. There you go. Just to uh, summarize, uh, coming out of the uh, perhaps the most severe recession since uh, the Great Depression, as many have called it, states uh, just uh, as a proxy for. American subnational government uh, states in general still feeling the squeeze of uh, declining revenues or the need to replenish uh, uh, funds, replenish rainy day funds that were that were tapped during the uh, the downturn. Uh, at the same time, um, sources of tax revenue have taken almost unprecedented hits in some states. Uh, where particularly you have a, a strong dependence on the, on the property tax market, uh, California, of course, being the most notable. Uh, at the same time, their commitments for spending aren't going anywhere soon. Uh, they've got uh, continuing growth of health, education, corrections, all those things that states and localities do for us or to us. And then um, the burgeoning... Uh, Areas of fiscal concern, which include things uh, such as, uh, uh, you know, an aging demographic, a aging population demographically, and uh, the whole concurrent pension situation. Oh, okay, got it now. Um, so over the last couple of years, we have states uh, working to narrow down and, and solve 146 billion dollars in uh, budget gaps. 2011-2012. Uh, the analysts at GAO reported that uh, the, the, the size of um, fiscal funding gaps and uh, shortfalls will continue and will need concerted effort from states and localities to, uh, to the extent of something like a 12.3% reduction in, in spending or simultaneous tax and uh, fee increases to close that shortfall over the next five decades. Uh, so that, with that heartening opening, I, I hate to be the, the wet blanket. It, it, it's a, uh, it's obvious that the states and localities, uh, muni large municipalities, have um, significant um, environmental factors, significant uh, impediments to uh, innovating, to delivering uh, services the way that they're currently delivering them, and hence innovation uh, is is a path is a path forward. Um, actually, this, I think I'll just skip this one. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the metrics of the tech industry, but we'll just go back to that one. Uh, I, I, in my uh, putting, putting together presentation, I just sampled some, some literature from Tech America, a couple of other associations that have made recommendations to governments that have, have worked with private sector companies to uh, channel their, think, their best thinking to, to government. And uh, the... Uh, the, the Tech CEO Council, which is a kind of competitor association, had a real nice document that they, they pulled together to create a sort of baseline set of recommendations for governments. Uh, as a precursor, uh, they, they wanted to put across a couple of points, and that is not all spending is created equal. Uh, same with taxation. There are different types of spending that tend to foster growth and foster innovation. And there are different types of taxation that can uh, impede or at the same time if it's spent correctly can can improve prospects for future growth so you know, these are some of the areas they identified um, as as and most of you know who've been in the private sector during a downturn your company your company is not going to completely cut r d spending uh, many leaders in the, in the field the intel and samsung's if anything, will maintain and, and sometimes increase during tough economic times. So they believe that the, equi the equivalent of R&D should, should go on in government to, to keep changing the way that governments deliver services. Uh, STEM education, obviously, infrastructure and IT infrastructure, government research in the, in, the, um, in the sciences, all yield future economic growth. Uh, they've targeted the um, approach, the kind of cross the board budget cut as a perhaps not the best way to go about managing the fiscal 
situation that cities and counties find themselves in. Um, and also call for a, an increase in focus on productivity, not so much as in the private sector with cost cutting and headcount reduction and those types of things, but in focusing on business process transformation, business process improvement, incremental improvements in uh, openness, collaboration, and creating that sort of virtuous cycle whereby processes improve, dysfunction goes away. So those were three of their sort of uh, foundational recommendations. Here I've, that I've got a list of seven um, strategies and initiatives that public sector organizations right now are implementing or considering implementing. Um, I think quite a bit of it will go back to uh, Lydia's presentation. Obviously, consolidation is is the, is the kind of been the low hanging fruit. A lot of states and localities have, have gone after that and quite successfully because there's quite a bit of uh, consolidating to be done. Um, I would say um, many of the largest states and cities are already well down, down that path. Streamlining supply chains, uh, most major companies went about that in the, the 90s and earlier part of the 2000s. Motorola served as one example, cutting out something like uh, 1.2 billion in their sales organizations by consolidating and streamlining their sales organizations. Energy use, another key target, uh, particularly where you have states and localities that are burning um, servers at 5 to 7 percent um, utilization of capacity. The cloud and virtualization are going to be huge um, in that space. And already uh, we're seeing examples in places like Michigan where they're cutting out millions of dollars in expenditure. Again, uh, tapping into the shared services theme, uh, I, you know, uh, there are cer certainly here I'm, I'm focusing on service delivery and cutting costs out of that with things like shared services and reduced energy use and, and what have you, but um, really we're starting to see um, shared services and, and some of those other um, initiatives that tap into the way businesses, uh, the, the states, the localities deliver their services to constituents as potentially re-engineering those processes, transforming those processes, and actually improving the end product. So I think you could expect to see more, more of those types of initiatives, both here in Illinois and in major states around the country. Um, business analytics and um, business intelligence, also another hot area right now in states and localities. Certainly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The amount of uh, payments going through major uh, big state governments is, uh, and some of the stories we've heard of waste, fraud, and abuse make that a, a ripe target for uh, the application of innovative solutions. Uh, for one, uh, I've, I've seen some examples in uh, Australia, uh, Australia's Centrelink initiative, Service Canada. In the US, we had uh, some large counties and states begin to um, really roll out uh, more advanced analytics. Uh, Alameda County is, is a big one in California with a, uh, I believe the uh, result was something like a 600% ROI in the first year and uh, fraud identification was up over 40%. So that, as governments struggle for funds, is, is certainly going to be one that, that comes to mind, comes to the forefront of their purchasing uh, intentions uh, and in, in changing up service delivery, um, moving out to a smaller footprint in the field, mobilizing the workforce, and of course increasing the amount of self-service are pretty, uh, pretty awesome, pretty evident tactics for this. And monetization, of course, the city of Chicago has done a bit of that. Um, plenty of <laughs> the OMB and the fe federal level, just to provide one example, of uh, 14,000 excess buildings that could be uh, utilized in a better way. And uh, so I'd be happy to uh, kind of just engage in some more discussion about uh, what governments can do to be more innovative and more cost uh, effective in the, uh, in the panel discussion. Now we have the presentation. <laughs> Next up is Maria with any luck.
opportunity for improvement or invention, I like to say. Okay, my name is Maria Thompson. I'm here from Motorola Solutions representing our chief technology office. And actually, Jim and I had talked about me going first because I'm going to talk about trends uh, that we all need to be aware of um, and that we all can capitalize on and opportunities in this space. So um, I got to do that. I'll introduce myself. Fail. Okay. Devices, all of us have one. Um, nearly 1 billion smart devices are shipped in 2011 and almost 500 billion in sales um, in 2011. And that includes iPads, it includes tablets, it includes um, mobile phones, it includes any kind of device like your Kindle. Um, voice to multimedia, so we're all used to talking with um, voice, but now we're all getting used to sharing pictures and video, and that's just the way we communicate anymore. So it's a much more rich communication experience, and governments uh, need to take advantage of this. By two 2016, it's projected that 213, two thirds of all, <laughs> of all mobile data traffic will be video. Um, and then also, uh, and I think it's even more than this today if we check the number, but about 72 hours of video is uploadable, uploaded to YouTube every minute. Um, and if none of you have teenagers uh, or aren't on Facebook, um, that's, that's happening all the time. Uh, it's very, very easy. Um, and the easier this gets to do, the more as your workforce expects to be able to do this on a job every day, too. Um, social networking, uh, 955 million active users on Facebook. And out of those, all 500 million, more than half, are accessing it via mobile devices. I know. My daughter's at college, she doesn't even talk to me um, from a computer anymore. It's always from her mobile device. Um, complexity, 68% of US consumers are taking their electronics back, not because they're defective or they have a bug, but because they just don't like them the way they work. They don't like the user interface, or it's too complicated. Um, and also, technology pays tablet disruption. Um, in, in less than two years, tablets have replaced pretty much PC sales. So what's going on? Um, since the 1960s, we've evolved from a centralized big computer, um, like Uniac, <laughs> to, to distributed computing. Um, personal computers, right, in the 80s. Uh, networked or wired computers in the 90s. Um, and if you look at the generation of workers that are coming in now, and the, and the teenagers that are writing all that software for free, by the way, so that nobody can make money writing software apps for phones anymore. Um, you have the 2000s with the mobile wireless trends, and then the 2010s. Um, and what's happening now um, is you have the cloud, and what that does is allow everybody everywhere on their smartphones to access reams and reams of data, right? So is that data, as that data grows, computing power has also grown on the same trend line. So we can process and generate much, much more data, right? And because of that, the information um, value per bit of that data is decreasing increasingly fast because we're also overwhelmed. Every device that we have, every place we go, there's more and more information being pushed to us. And I, I hesitate to call it information. It's really data. Um, and then the cognitive um, 
processing load that you have to take on has increased. So to make any sense out of all this data that you have getting pushed to you and shown to you and use it to do anything that makes sense is much, much more difficult. So what we're doing at Motorola Solutions is trying to make information actionable and useful. And um, our technology investments are around helping people be their best in the moments that matter, meaning um, we want you to have the right information at the right person, the right person's getting it, not everybody's getting flooded with it, but the people that need it, and at the right time, so it's context sensitive. Um, and then we've been enabling that by investment in our technologies, products, services, and solutions, and we're changing our company. I don't know if you want to talk to me afterwards about what Motorola Solutions is, but we are not the handset people. We have representatives from there today. Um, so what is, what is our uh, product portfolio look like? And everybody is migrating toward this kind of uh, view of their world, not only in public safety and governments, but also in um, retail enterprise. There's a lot of uh, commonality here. So you have out there in the infrastructure, you have video cameras, you have RFID, you have barcode scanning, you have location with maps, GPS device, almost every cell phone, every smartphone out there has GPS on it. Um, and sensors, there's sensors of all types being deployed in all the buildings. Um, over the wireless network, right? You don't have to dig up a lot of ground and lay a lot of landlines anymore or optical fibers. You're getting a lot more performance out of the wireless infrastructure. And then sensor analytics capabilities and services are something that we're building at Motorola Solutions um, that follow certain business and operational rules that are specific to the situation, the context, which kind of operation you're in and what kind of employees you have um, and where they all are situated. Um, and then deployment of the information actions to specific parts of the workforce um, over the wireless network and everybody's connected, whether you have a radio, whether you have a smartphone, whether you have a tablet, or et cetera. So what we're trying to do is go from real time information or data generation to right time data so that you get the right data at the right time that's sensitive to your needs but also to predict it so that we in advance know who we need to send it to, what kind of information to take out of the reams of data, um, and help everybody be productive right, at, right when they get it and have only useful information that's sent to them. Um, my uh, CTO, Paul Steinberg, just wrote a chapter in this book. I know it's a very wordy slide, but I thought it was interesting. This book just was published last week, and um, it's called CIO Leadership for Public Safety Emerging Trends and Practices, and um, each chapter was written by somebody who works in this space, so it's, it's a very interesting and timely book for all of you to consider looking at. Um, Q&A? <laughs> We have only about five minutes, so rather than do a panel discussion, um, why don't we entertain questions from the audience? And the focus of the discussion was going to be on how technology can help um, state, local, county governments um, become much more efficient and deliver better services to their constituents. Um, and we'll hear more about that later, but if there are any questions, we'll entertain those now so as not to be too far behind the schedule. I have questions I can ask. <laughs> um, I can speak up. <clears throat> Maybe a, just a comment for the panelists on you know, the, the, the public-private um, engagement model that that you think may be the most effective. Uh, and that's a pretty broad question, but how do you take the legacy that Cook County has, the the, you know, the, the cutting-edge networks that are deployed for? public infrastructure today, you know, from all the carriers and, and then all the potentially, you know, uh, internal networks and applications that, uh, you know, the companies have and, and optimize that. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, so, um, at Cook County, we're definitely looking at where, am I on? Hi, okay. Hi. 
Um, so at Cook County, we're, we are definitely looking at where does it make sense to um, have private partners help us. Um, for the mainframe in particular, we just September 1st, the day before I started, they migrated from supporting it in-house to working with a partner Axiom to support um, the mainframe. We, had, uh, we owned our own dying box um, and they uh, outsourced support of the mainframe. We picked up all the data in Cook County and moved it to a private partner. And that's a great relationship. It's a healthy relationship for the county as we migrate those applications um, off. I think that um, as the CIO, I want to, where it is more of a commodity to, to do help desk support, um, break fix, where it is more of a commodity, I'd rather ha have a vendor do that and get really good pricing and have my staff focused on um, you know, what technologies we need to be investing in, project managing new applications um, and adding value that way than supporting things that are becoming more and more of a commodity. Hi, um, I'm, my name's Martin O'Shill. I started an entity called Windy City SDR. Um, essentially, what, what we're doing is we use one hardware platform to manage all your wireless modulation schemes. So essentially, you can take a wireless device and run a different application and it become, go from an AM, FM radio to a TV broadcast station or an access point or a GSM base station. This is technology that allows municipalities, governments to create revenue streams for yourselves as well as running your own infrastructure. I'm interested, how do I go about, the question is, is how do I go about doing a demonstration uh, presentation before people in the city government uh, level uh, to present uh, this technology? That's the question. We, yeah, let, we can talk about that after the show, <laughs> since we're running out of time. Excellent question, though. One last question for the panel. Hi, uh, Travis Bauer, the Senate. Um, this question is geared towards you, Bob, but uh, the general panel as well. Bob, can you talk a little bit about the journey that you took um, to get to that one, that single platform? Oh, I, I, I think that that transformation is something that uh, can be shared from an enterprise standpoint. Mm -hmm. Each one of the suppliers and vendors can hear something as well as some of the relative stakeholders who have um, objectives that are similar to what you were able to overcome with. Sure, happy to. Um, this normally can take anywhere from an hour to four hours. <laughs> How about two, uh, but uh, I'll do it in a minute or two. Um, there's there's a number of different aspects to our journey. I mean, obviously we're multitasking, doing multiple things at the same time, and there's a lot of it that's technology driven. So things like network replacement, data center consolidation, ras rationalizing applications. We started with well over 2,000 applications. We're now less than 500. Um, but all of that within the construct of having a, a set of strategic guiding principles that we were trying to achieve in alignment with where our business was going. And so there's a lot of different actions. Uh, with the technology change that's occurring every day, it also provides uh, new opportunities. So we're very heavy, heavily virtualized. The virtualization technologies have been around for several years now, but you need to be able to take out enough cost to be able to reinvest in those new technologies to be able to drive that step function change as well. So that's been an important part of our journey. I just want to, um, oh, we'll take one more. One quick one. Okay. Um, this is specifically for CIO. I heard that Brown Emanuel is doing, finally going to be doing 211 in Chicago, and that Cook County is going to join in. And I'm wondering what the idea is, how you're going to bring together all the partners. I'm hoping you're going to include libraries and, and others. Um, so Brett Goldstein is the CIO of, of the City of Chicago, and um, we have a weekly meeting, which is something that 16 months ago <coughs> never happened. Um, my predecessor, who was uh, CIO, uh, Greg Watts, who returned to the state, um, had started having communications, but we made it a weekly um, occurrence. And you know, certainly we've talked about uh, our telecom systems, you know, how we're taking in information and distributing information. 
I, we don't have a, a detailed plan yet on, on 211, but um, there are easily 30 things in the queue that we're working on together um, to roll out, but I don't have any specifics about 211 to give you, sorry. Details to follow. Well, I'd like to take one second to, to thank the panel. I think it would be very difficult to assemble four better experts on the question at hand. It's a really terrific group, and you guys did a great job. I know, in addition to Bob's four hour answer, we probably could have gone on for several days easily in the interest of keeping the program on track. I do really want to thank, appreciate all four of you for taking the time today. To <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, what, we, we need more time. <laughs> so let's just camp out until uh, this evening, right? Order in a couple of pizzas and we're ready to go. Uh, Jim, we'd like to acknowledge and appreciate you and uh, for your wonderful panel. And uh, we're going to have a couple people join us here. Uh, I'd like to invite Travis Powers, who is a senior executive partner at Ascendant, Brenna Berman, who is first deputy commissioner for the city of Chicago, Deirdre Jenkins, senior vice president, director of supplier diversity for Northern Trust Bank, and Poonam Gupta Krishnan. Can you join us here for the presentation of acknowledgement and awards? And we also would like to acknowledge uh, two of our speakers. Bob Kress has a terrific book, uh, Running IT Like a Business, that he referenced. And we're going to be gifting each of our speakers with a copy of this. Bob will be around also. I believe he has extra copies. As well as Praveen Gupta's newest book, The Innovation Solution, Making Innovation More Pervasive, Predictable, and Profitable, and uh, Blueprint for Success the book that I call author with Stephen Covey and Ken Blanchard. So we have a copy of these for our speakers. Please give our speakers and our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Let's have a short break. We'll have a break until 3.10, when promptly we'll be back with the Honorable Tony Franklin, President of Coast County, will be our speaker. See you at 3.10, please. And we have a very, very excellent presentation, two more presentations, and uh, another panel. So a lot to pack in here in the next short period of time. I'd like to invite Travis M. Powers, Hi, how are you? Senior Executive Partner of Ascendant, to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Tony Prinkwinkle. Travis, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, everyone who's shown today. Um, what you guys think of that first panel? Well, we're going to uh, keep things moving in a progressive manner. We have a uh, very distinguished guest, and uh, while everyone can read that beautiful bio, I'd rather talk from an experience standpoint versus uh, read her bio, as you all are very, very capable of doing. Um, it's my, my, pre my privilege to introduce um, Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle. And there, I think of three words whenever people have asked, or when I even have the chance to think of how I would describe her, and I would say one is accountable, 
uh, second, committed, and thoroughly engaged. A um, few years ago when I was uh, the chair of Chicago Minority Supply Development Council's Advocacy Committee, and several of my friends in this room uh, were part of the council's committee, we went through a legislative process to make sure that those that were running for public office had a chance to voice their opinions, ideas, platforms, agendas, and engage with uh, civic leaders who happen to be minority business owners um, to, and we actually came up with a scorecard. Well, President Preckwick today, then candidate and all, former alderman, <laughs> took part in that process. She was the first to commit to it. Uh, we scored the candidates, and by and large, we, we began to support those based off of their views and their policies that they would be implementing. And so today I stand before you knowing that uh, a few short years ago, now too, uh, she was just a candidate and had been a long time alderman. Uh, I'm a third ward, re third ward resident, and even my ward has been a benefactor of the transformational things she was able to do in the second ward, I mean the fourth ward. And so uh, even today when I think of engagement, um, I, I have the privilege of seeing uh, President Craig Winkle in, I won't tell which market, but some mornings <laughs> we're in the same market and she'll tap me, hi Travis, how are you? And we'll have a, a nice, pleasant exchange before the crowds come or what have you. But I just want to thank her and thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, I'd like to guess, give the floor over to you, Honorable thank you. Tony Breckwinkle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right, let's try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So I'm a teacher by profession, um, as you might have guessed. I want to thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm pleased to speak at the Technology Innovation Summit, and I'm grateful to the Illinois Institute uh, of Technology and Northern Trust for hosting me today. We appreciate it. And I'm joined today by our uh, new Chief Information Officer, Lydia Murray, who has been on the job, I think, six weeks. <laughs> Two years ago, when I was sworn in as president of the county, I, I laid out my vision, founded on four key principles. We were going to be fiscally responsible, bring new leadership to the county, be transparent and accountable, and <clears throat> improve services. And I think everyone here will agree that technology uh, impacts each of those principles. As a result, our approach is multi-pronged. We are advancing technology at the county in a number of directions across, down, and out. So let me explain. I'll start with how we're working across county organizations. The ability to collect tax revenue is one of our critical functions. The county collects for and distributes to more than a thousand taxing bodies, such as school systems and municipalities. Additionally, the county collects nearly 400 million in taxes outside of property taxes, such as those on vehicles and tobacco. And yet the county's process for collecting these taxes for business and individuals was almost entirely manual and labor intensive. So we knew we had to automate the revenue collection process and to do it in a way that was both cost effective and easy to use. We looked around at a number of systems to buy and came up with a better idea. Rather than building our own system at considerable cost, we decided to partner with the state and share the system that they built. The logic is clear. It makes financial sense to leverage the investment that the state was making anyway. Uh, and as a result, we implemented a large scale integration of our tax collection system that would have cost the county tens of millions of dollars to institute on its own. Instead, the county and the state will split the cost of supporting one system instead of supporting their own system separately. Furthermore, it's easier for residents. All of county taxpayers are already paying the state for identical taxes. No longer will residents have to log into one system to file and pay their taxes and then log into a second system to pay their county portion of the tax. Now we can put everything in one place. Once a, a user has logged on, he or she can click a button to agree to pay their state portion of the tax and then a, a second button to agree that, to pay their county portion of the tax. You enter your bank or your credit card information and the payment is made instantly. And it's received by both the county and the state. Overall, this collaboration will ensure we are better able to 
uh, ensure compliance, and as a result, collect the revenues. Right now, the county and the state uh, do not share a lot of information, uh, meaning we don't talk about who is paying one level of government but not another. So we need to work more closely in that regard as well, making it significantly easier for both governments to make sure that we are both paid appropriately. I've charged my chief information officer, that's Lydia, and revenue director with getting the agreement with the state and the consolidated system up and running by 2013. In 2013, I shouldn't say by 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Lydia's gonna have a heart attack right here in the front row. Uh, we're also working with the city of Chicago. Previously, the city and the county shared little beyond the hallway. Uh, right after the mayor was elected and before he was sworn in, he and I had sat down and we, we said that it didn't make sense, that the city and the county didn't work more closely together. So we, we put together a city-county collaboration. Uh, we each named three or four people to a task force. Uh, they began meeting in June of 2011 and, and came up with their report in September of, of 2011. Um, and basically they, they focus on a, a couple of dozen ideas of how we could work together more, more efficiently. Uh, one of the primary focuses of their recommendations were that we should share more data between our two governments. Historically, even though our systems are dependent on one another for successful outcomes for residents, uh, there were very few cases of data sharing across the two organizations, across the city and the county. <coughs> Consider this, when the police, Chicago Police Department uh, arrests someone, they enter the information in their system and print out the arrest report. Previously, however, both the Cook County State's Attorney and the Public Defender uh, had to re-input all this arrest information into their case management system. This is time, clearly, that could be better spent. As a result of our efforts, we're already making improvements to encourage data sharing across these organizations. The State's Attorney has been able to link their case management system with the Chicago Police Department, and the Public Defender will do so by the end of this calendar year. Next, we're working on pushing technology down throughout the county. Cook County has in our uh, GIS, Geographic Information Services, one of the best uh, IT mapping shops anywhere in the country. The unit is responsible for mapping all of the county and they make really good maps. This is important to me, not just because I'm a history teacher that used to teach geography. Um, <coughs> good maps matter. They matter when we're assessing property. They matter when people go to the polls to vote. They matter uh, when we're trying to expand or enhance a county road. Good maps matter when you want to start a business and you need to know about zoning designation. Good maps matter when, it, when there's an ownership dispute and we need to know where one property starts and another ends. So the problem is often the good map mapping technology is very, very expensive. It's certainly out of reach of most of the 135 municipalities in Cook County. Most of those towns can only dream of buying the mapping technology that we have here in the county. In the same way that the state is sharing the functionality of their high-end tax collection system with the county, um, we're sharing our mapping technology with the municipalities within the, county, within the county. So I'm announcing that this year I'm going to offer online access and application-based training for our county mapping technology to all of the villages and jurisdictions in Cook County. With this service, they can have access to our state-of-the-art mapping tools that they could never afford on their own. For a, a, a small fee, we will now allow municipalities throughout the county to utilize our mapping tools in their jurisdiction in any number of significant applications. For example, they will be better able to track their assets in their communities, do more integrated emergency response planning with our Department of Homeland Security, and make better zoning decisions using county mapping technology. Lastly, we are working to push our technology out. The first way is by pushing data out to residents to increase engagement and participation. Last year, the county launched Cook County Open Data, our open data website. To date, we've posted more than 300 data sets from county agencies, bureaus, and departments. Residents can find our data on, on services, on contracts, our checkbook, freedom of information requests, just to name a few. On one hand, making this quantity of data available to residents is a tremendous step toward transparency and accountability. However, the amount of data available 
also means that it can be overwhelming for residents. Therefore, we've made a concerted effort to make our information more user friendly, working with partners to identify where data can solve problems or provide context, as well as working to create maps and metrics to help residents gain more knowledge. A great example of this is the information we distribute in conjunction with our budget process. Last week, I announced my third budget. As part of the budgeting process, we developed online forums to get input on budgeting ideas and tweeted information about the budget highlights during the budget announcement. <coughs> we also worked with a group of local web developers to create user-friendly versions of our 2013 information. The county's budget website, along with Look at Cook web pages, display the county's budgets and expenditures from 1993 to 2012, for 20 years in simple and clear charts. The county has also taken data around performance and distilled the metrics down to a handful of key measures we are reporting in our performance management initiative. It's called STAR, Set Targets, Achieve Results. Perhaps the best example came in April when we partnered with a group called Chicago Big Data and eventually became an integral part of the first Global Big Data Week. <coughs> Who knew? During Big Data Week, Cook County supplied air quality data that was used by teams of developers in 10 cities around the world to create a better model to predict patterns of air quality. In addition, the county is working with partners to display the data in usable ways. These data sets also ha have been used by independent developers and other digital entrepreneurs who write codes that helps the public to use the data in interesting ways. During Big Data Week, we produced two online events that focused on the needs of local developers as well as local digital equipment, digital economic development. To understand this and how all it works, you need to go to data.cookcountyil.gov. We have a video showing how we are using and promoting open data. This is the second way that we are pushing technology out. We are also using technology to advance digital economic development. Our data can be used to help digital entrepreneurs to produce products faster and find new markets easier. This year, the, the county was a co-sponsor of Apps for Metro Chicago, a contest where teams of developers used data supplied by the county, the state of Illinois, and the city of Chicago to build online applications to serve public needs. The winner was the online application from SpotHero.com. SpotHero.com uh, helps you find and reserve discounted parking spaces in 100 garages in the Chicago area. And now they're expanding across the nation. We further economic development by ensuring that our communities have access to high-speed internet. In the same way that developing highways for vehicles in the 50s and 60s promoted economic development. High-speed internet, network, internet networks are the new highways that promote economic development in our time. To that end, Cook County has devoted $10 million to broadband development in the county. Along with a grant of $6 million from the state, Cook County is investing in fiber optic connections in underserved neighborhoods on the south and west sides of the city. Our first broadband investment is focused on the provision of health care by linking our Cook County hospital system, health and hospital system on the near west side, to all of our offices downtown with excess CPA fiber. Our hospital system is beginning to think about ways to deliver telemedicine and healthcare services electronically as well. This last week, Governor Quinn announced that nine neighborhoods anchored by the Woodlawn community will be receiving a two million gigabit challenge grant that is being matched by an additional two million from the University of Chicago. Because of this grant, Woodlawn's health center will be able to share electronic medical records, x-rays, and other medical images with the rest of the Cook County Health and Hospital System in an instant. Having our entire healthcare system linked up in this way means that many of the assessments and services that traditionally require a trip to a specialist at Stroger Hospital can soon be provided a couple blocks from home in that south side neighborhood. In all of these directions, across, down, and out, you can see that we are continuing to look at information technology collaboration and leverage opportunities across the region and, and trying to be more transparent and accountable by continuing to make information, not just data, available to Cook County residents 
and to enable county operations to serve our residents better. I'll close by mentioning a fourth direction, pulling people in. We need all kinds of talent in Cook County, and I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish to date. We're setting a new foundation for county government to move forward, and because of that, we're truly able to push the boundaries on for what too long has been the status quo. But I know there's a lot more work to be done, as you do, with all of our efforts, collaboration is the key. Technology, technology is an area where we're making investments and we need talented, innovative leaders to help keep the county moving forward. Over the week, next weeks and months, we will be filling key positions in IT, IT project management, business analysis, and web development. So I urge you to reach out to our office, in particular to Lydia, who's right here. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. That's all right. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation today. I'd be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. My, my father, Leroy L. Shields, started the CAP, Chicago Police Department's CAPS program. Sure enough, he was a commander in the police department. Exactly right. Um, and one of the chief complaints that he was having was uh, how the different departments couldn't speak because they did, had different radios and different radio frequencies. I've come up with a software-defined radio board that will allow all different departments to speak using the same hardware. And I just wanted to make you aware that I'm planning, hopefully, doing a presentation between before some of the government entities over there at City Hall with regard to this, to really next-level technology. Okay, well, so this is the county. Um, he should, you should talk to Lydia. I have her card and everything. And, uh, and, uh, and probably Lydia can arrange for you to meet with our Homeland Security um, great. staff, Michael Masters and his crew. Great, okay. great, thank you. Good, yeah. That's what I was at, at the Innovation Awards. And um, you just said that the county is going to be needing some talent. How proactive will the county be in searching for local talent? hired anybody who doesn't already live in the region, so. <laughs> yes, we're looking for local talent is the short answer. Yeah, Travis. Yes, uh, President Preck, can you talk a little bit more about some of the um, objectives that you have on your desk right now, particularly how technology or enablement of technology may be able to support some of those, those objectives like public health, um, how you're modernizing the use of the land for the forest preserves, I think those are, are great, you know, tentacles for a broader discussion so that others can understand the transformational things that you're bringing in terms of policy and implementation to uh, the county. Okay, public health. 35% uh, of our budget in the county is public health, about 39 to 40% is public safety. So three quarters of our dollars are either public health or public safety. Uh, we're in the process of securing, we hope it will come through in the next couple of weeks, a a waiver, it's called an 1115 waiver, for the Medicaid program to enable us to start enrolling now people who will be eligible for Medicaid in uh, January of 2014 under President Obama's Affordable Care Act. Um, in order to do that, in order to uh, implement that waiver, we're going to have to uh, enroll and begin serving very quickly um, as many as possible of the uninsured uh, pool of 250,000 people in Cook County, uh, 115,000 we serve already. So um, one of the things we're looking at is the ways in which technology can assist us in uh, identifying the people who are already in our patient population and the people who are in CareLink who get um, uh, meds from us and get them into our system quickly. So that's a, an area in which we're going to need a lot of um, IT help. Um, what, was your, what was the second part of your question? Uh, Forest Reserve, Forest I was Reserve. using that. Yeah. Um, you know, although I'm president of the board of the Forest Preserve District, the truth is that um, most of my time gets focused on the county. Uh, what the Forest Preserve doing, is doing at the moment is a lot of planning around um, the future of the Forest Preserve District. This is our 100th anniversary. We were the first Forest Preserve District in the country. We have uh, almost 11% of the land in the county, which is an extraordinary amount. So we're not only the, uh, the first forest preserve, I think we're about the biggest as well. 
And so we're doing planning kind of for the next hundred years about how we're going to use this resource. And um, one of the things we've been doing is trying to use um, our, our Forest Preserve website to get out more information about the resources of the Forest Preserve. Uh, where they are, you can go and find out what's, which one is closest to you. You can find out what the activities are that are planned for the month across the district. Um, we have done, I think, a good job of ratcheting up the uh, profile of the Forest Preserve District in the last couple of years, but we still have a long way to go, particularly for people in the city who don't um, know that we have a Forest Preserve District, uh, let, alone, <laughs> let alone where the nearest Forest Preserves are. So we're, we're trying to use um, our website in the Forest Preserve to, to uh, make more people aware of uh, the fact that the Forest Preserves are there and, and the activities that go on there. So that one's that was really kind of outreach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, there's a different rule. <coughs> yes. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Pam McElvain with Diversity MBA, and I definitely want to thank you, uh, President Preckwinkle, for supporting me. Um, what is it? I heard just an hour ago an incredible innovation uh, panelist speak, and your CIO was on there. Um, first, I want to say I was shocked <laughs> to see that um, the work that Cook County has to do in technology and the movement that you have begun to make. One of the question I wanted to ask you was um, clearly you're moving strategically and with your new CIO, but I heard of a, I heard a lot of innovation, and I um, was wondering would you consider if you haven't considered already a think tank around. Um, some of the kinds of solutions that companies like Motorola and Accenture have brought to the table to streamline technology as well as increase their ROI, but a think tank of, co of companies that can come and support your um, objectives and initiatives, as because I can see over the past two decades nothing has happened in technology. Um, well, I think you should talk to Lydia. Um, she's welcome to set up whatever kind of advisory uh, groups she feels are um, helpful in in achieving our mission, so talk to her. All right, sir. Yeah, well, um, great presentation. Good to hear from uh, technology savvy Cook County president. So the great, <laughs> great technology president. Well, uh, my question I is. People work for me. I have a, I have a cell phone that I only make calls on. So I'm gonna make calls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, question is, we are investing so much in infrastructure and in, uh, in the broadband and the uh, and the access. But to use all those technology, what are we doing investing in our citizens? To how to use it, how to create new opportunities. So do you have plans and investments in, um, in citizens? So you're talking about the digital divide. Um, well, the truth of the matter at the moment is we're, we're, uh, we're stuck on a fiber optic cable and um, um, that part of the system. And unfortunately, this is a, um, a class-related issue, right? It's education and class. Uh, who, has, who has the uh, understanding this is important and who has the money to uh, get the hardware that they need? Um, you know, so I live in a household where both my daughter and my, my husband have computers. I don't. Um, my daughter and my husband have computers. But, you know, what percentage of our households have one computer, let alone several. I mean, that doesn't count my daughter's laptop and, you know, her phone and all the rest of the stuff that she, her iPod and all the other stuff that she has. But anyway, um, you know, this is a real, um, this is a real problem in our society, and uh, um, it's not something that the county has begun to address. We're just trying to um, put the foundation in place. So that's as far as you've gotten. Uh, Tony, thank you again for your lead leadership and your sense of urgency in these matters and your command of the facts are very impressive. Uh, just before I ask my question, I will make a comment that I know that uh, one of the things that's combining in the city and the county is uh, human capital development. And I believe uh, your chief uh, has gone on to now head up both the combined program of both county and city programs that deal with uh, training and development and meeting the needs of employers and those types of things. That might be an opportunity for a think tank to describe what the needs are so that those types of training programs could be most impactful for the open jobs that exist 
And this talent scales from things that people can learn in high school through what they can learn in certification programs through what they can learn in college. So we need to uh, innovate around the way these programs are deployed, and that may be an opportunity. I forget the uh, young lady's name who's the director. Karen Warrington Reeves. That's exactly correct. <laughs> and again, your command of your troops is very impressive. But nonetheless, uh, I think that's an area where that type of engagement in a think tank type discussion and some of our uh, people can help with some innovation there can be very helpful. My question or, or opportunity is I happen to be on a statewide uh, organization, Broadband Illinois, the Partnership for Connect Illinois, which serves to oversee broadband investments throughout the entire state. But what I'm interested in is you described an asset which is unbelievably important to this process, and that's GIS and mapping. You have to know where the fiber is in order to leverage that fiber. And one of the real challenges is what you point out, is that a lot of our towns and uh, collar counties in those areas have no clue where that kind of fiber is. I'd love to see your GIS resource be applied to fiber mapping, and we have some folks from our organization in the room today which should follow up to make sure that that a tremendous asset is used to map where fiber is in both the county, the collar counties in those areas, and make that aware to people in our municipalities so that they can think of ways of leveraging that for the kind of deployment issues that have been described in this conference. Okay, um, that's, that's a to-do for Lydia. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. Okay. President yes, Tony, um, I know how important education is to you, obviously, from, from long, as an educator. Right. And I look at this, this the summit we're having, we're talking about innovation, technology innovation, and I'm certain you recognize that the under, under, underserved, right. that, that you mentioned that, alluded to that, are not capable of having access to that. Is there some consideration to how we resolve that solution around the county and the city combined to improve the connection between those un, underserved, uh, students that will advance our, our education process. Right, well there, there are two institutions that can be immensely helpful in this. One is our public schools, of course, and the other is our public libraries. Um, and the county doesn't really have anything to do with either of those. Those are um, local municipal functions. Um, but, you know, I think our libraries are moving toward being, you know, IT centers and not simply book centers. Okay. Um, so a lot of our public libraries have, have access to computers and can help kids um, learn how to use them, although it's usually the kids that are teaching the adults how to use them. Um, so I, I guess through public education and public libraries, that, that's the access point for people who don't have the um, resources at home to have their own you know, computers or laptops or whatever. And again, that those are, those are the responsibilities of our cities and towns and villages, and it's not what the county takes on. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you for your informative and session and your leadership. We appreciate that very much. May I invite Kunan Gupta Krishnan to come and present our certificate of appreciation? Uh, Kevin McDermott, Director of IT for Cook County. Kevin's uh, remaining with us. Uh, Gary Zubak, president of AITP Chicago. Unum is, uh, yes, Travis Powers, please. Uh, would, you, would you come up and we'll present uh, our certificate of appreciation to President Kirchhoff. We also have uh, several of our panelists, our authors, and we'd like to give to you their books as well. Oh, thank so you. we'll be doing that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Good. to introduce Praveen Gupta, Director of IIT Center for Innovation Thank Science you. and Application and President of Acelper Consulting as our next speaker. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gupta has had distinguished careers at Motorola and AT&T Bell Laboratories and Mr. Gupta is an entrepreneur, educator, and has authored Business Innovation in the 21st Century, 
and the innovation solution. We have uh, one of his, his latest book with us today. Mr. Gupta, like many of you, has a passion for helping people maximize innovation and make it profitable, predictable, and pervasive. And uh, with that, we'd like to welcome uh, Praveen Gupta to our podium. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kathleen. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for making me part of this program. We recognized in 2003 that uh, we will be in a situation where we will have to create a lot of jobs. I know Sam Pitarat in the morning talked about creating 500 million jobs in India, but I think we need to create 50 million in USA. So I want to help those 50 million in USA through the innovation process. We realize a lot of people are creating strategies for innovation, they're creating policies for innovation, but nobody's working on developing science and engineering of innovation. So how do you do it? I mean, it's easy to talk about, but how do you do this? And if you notice, most entrepreneurship centers that you have found, they have under-delivered over promise in terms of creating jobs. And there are 5,500 entrepreneurship centers, and they haven't delivered what they could have done. So my attempt here really is to share with you the how innovation can be used in developing uh, community opportunities and, and businesses and jobs. And if you notice, jobs have been lost because businesses have been closed. So jobs can only be created because new businesses have to be created. And large companies are not able to create enough jobs. So we recognize that whenever you have time in history, turn the economy around, turn the country around, you have to involve people. You have to turn around, it's kind of a revolution. So you have to really get people involved in creating a large number of businesses, hundreds and thousands of them, not one, two, three, four, five. We need thousands of espadios, we need many groupons, we need many more new Motorola than and Bell Labs. So today's topic really is, is America's World War III, except I was presenting in uh, Croatia, and somebody said, why innovation does not get the media attention? You know, if you kill somebody, everybody will know about you. This guy killed somebody. But if you create something new, nobody will know about it. Nobody wants to talk about this. So I said, well, they taught me that you have to sensationalize innovation. So it is really World War III, the one way to sensationalize innovation. It's not really what World War III is winning the World War III. <laughs> And so how do we do this? It's going on. So I will show you one perspective. If you look at the World War I, it was fought with everything with the four legs, four wheels. And then the World War II was called aerial war. So in the World War I, 21 million people participated. World War II, maybe 35 to 50 million people participated. And then what happened? It ended with this big explosion. And Einstein was sort of, and his work was used to end the World War. So he was very disappointed that what a wonderful discovery was used for for destructive purposes. So he thought, well, he said, you know, I don't know how the World War III would be fought, but the World War IV would be fought <laughs> with sticks and stones. That gave me an opportunity to find how the World War III would be fought. So World War III would be fought with these guys, <laughs> with these nerves. And these are the weapons of mediocrity destruction. <laughs> so really, our problem in America is not as much as innovation, it is the mediocrity. It is a, it's acceptable performance, it is okay job, and that's what hurting it most. We are no longer the best, we used to be the best, then perfection was not required, but now we are losing jobs because we are not able to compete globally producing that perfect product. If you notice, in USA we invest about billion dollars per million people every year on R&D, and we get about 100 patents per million people every year. If you, and out of those, if only 10% are successful, that means we are investing about $100 million per, per patent. That's just too expensive. And we can, so we are, what are we doing? We are outsourcing R&D. We're sending some cheaper places. So the issue is not that we teach people how to create, how to innovate, but how to create and innovate when we need to. And we have done a lot of research on this. We teach a class at IIT Chicago, at UIC, and some other universities around the country and Mexico. But what we have learned, that first of all, everyone in this room or outside has brain and the power to create and innovate. And this internet age has created so much opportunity to this generation, of all of us, to be big innovators. It is not really a worldwide war, it is a worldwide war, WWW war, where the building block of innovation is no longer large corporations. It's not the four walls, but every individual has the potential to create big innovation. And if you notice, 
any new large business that is not being created by existing businesses. If anything, many of them have been destroyed by big businesses when they acquire them and kill them. So, and why is that so? Yes, we need access to internet, we need access to technology, but we need to learn how to use it. And there's not enough research and work done, except what we have done, in terms of teaching people. So one thing we have done, we have made innovation a learned skill. And that happens in every field. Every field is started with observations, soft skills, art, and then becomes a science. Our focus is then how do you create science of innovation? And the reason everyone can be so innovative because you have access to same resources as large corporations do. You can collaborate anywhere, everywhere, experts in the world. And somebody has said that if Einstein had not discovered E is equal to MC squared, Lawrence was about to discover it six months later. So what Einstein did, he accelerated it. So the issue is not to learn how to innovate, but how to innovate fast. And give you some idea, product life cycles are shrinking. And our corporations cannot keep up with the rate of innovation required. The return on investment innovation is 15, 20 cents in the last century. That means it takes six, seven years to just recover the investment. We can't afford six, seven years. So something else has to be done to change it because the world is on our fingertips. So it's in our economy. You know, it used to be everything made in the USA was the best in the world. But if you look around, anywhere, shopping center, anywhere, what is the best we make now? Do, can we say this is the best made in America? Right. Really, it's very difficult to find. So you can say this is we are proud of made in America, best in the world. Very difficult. You go for shopping. Now it is all made for America. It's not made in, but made for. So how do you change the process? And we went through a lot of research and finding out those uh, answers. Today we have over 16 trillion debt. You know, I was reviewing yesterday uh, that uh, we have, as individuals, per citizen, we have on the average assets of quarter million dollars and debt of million dollars. So every one of us, per person, we have about three quarter million debt as a nation. They're very significant, and we pay about trillion dollars in interest every year. We don't even make that much money. So you can't turn around the large corporations profit unless individuals go massive, 5,000, 10,000. If I have Cook County, if a Tony Pregwinkle is here, I would say start 10,000 new businesses in Cook County. It's not one, two, three, five, four, or 20 or 100, a large number of people. So we look at the, this is the last year, so two years ago. If you notice, two years ago it was 14.3 trillion, now it's 16 trillion. We are the largest consuming society, $16 trillion, number one. But in managing our accounts, we are the last, literally the last country. We are the worst manager of our money, as per the CIA website. So something has to be done. But luckily, as we say, God bless America, because we have a lot of resources. We are blessed with a lot of resources. And that we've been surviving for so long. So what can be done? You know, my question was, why American manufacturing is struggling? It was a genuine question. Why everybody, why can we make as good as anybody else make? And my response was that the broader in a society it is, that means the deeper it is rooted. And if the deeper it's rooted, that means the older the principle. So I went back almost 100 years, so which principle was really hurting us? And it was after Frederick Taylor did time motion studies for the industrialization, then there were some other principles developed by Schuhart. And so we learned a model called PDCA for quality. And as we said, more law revived at one time because they said at the peak of our quality strength, but then as a country, our quality still stinks in most products. We are not able to compete because of the infrastructure, the limitations and everything else. So what we found, the model that was developed in 1929 for product management, we still use it for process management. And that doesn't work. So we went up researching what, where it went. So we sent the damage to Japan. So they fixed some of those things. So we developed a new model. So the question is, you look at this, one of the VPs said, you know America's culture? Like Nike say, just do it. Versus doing it well. So we have to change our culture. So she said, you know America's culture is? Shoot and aim. <laughs> and the whole world is aiming and shooting at us. So we have to learn how to aim and shoot. There's a model developed, and this shows you the return on innovation of the companies. You know, uh, here, you look at the best companies, P&G, Procter & Gamble in America, that have never lost money for the last 50 some years, and always profitable quarters. They invest about $4 billion every in R&D, and they recover $400 million. Something like this. So you have 10, 20% return on investment. 
that is not going to cut it in this knowledge age. This century is called a smart century. A smart century, if you notice all those innovations, are uh, smart innovations, a smart device, a smart education, a smart presentations, and everything. And they don't take that much time to innovate. But we must learn how to use the information, the intelligence, to create new knowledge. You heard early in the morning, Sam Pedroda said, you know, we have the talent, but how do you create new knowledge? So we developed the process, we developed the education, the curriculum, how to create new knowledge. And not only create new knowledge, but how to use it very quickly to develop solutions much faster. So what we want to do is, as a community, and my, my mission was that how do we utilize I was talking to Wheaton City Council in, in the village of Wheaton. They said, well, we have 40,000 residents, but this is a landlocked community. We can't start any more new business. I said, when Apple started, how much land they have? A garage. I said, how many garages do you have? <laughs> so every community has a lot of garages. So we don't need extra land. How much money Steve Jobs said to start a business? Not a lot of money. It is not the money, it's not the infrastructure, the people. So how do we get people motivated, excited, like a Steve Jobs was or anybody else. So what intent is he started a business. Our goal is we should take our either people in transition or people in experts in any areas, and every community has it. And we have to build the community by community, creating new large number of businesses. So think of identifying opportunities in every community. And there are a lot of challenges every community has. What can be done? Do it best so nobody else can take it away this time. That's the only way to bring manufacturing jobs back in this country is not the rebuilding, but whatever new we create, create so nobody else can take it away. Protect it first before it goes out to like for slender is lost because the solar manufacturing became cheaper in somewhere else. Nowhere we cannot compete globally. We have to find that out and grow the business, create the jobs, do the right things. Reclaim American pride and you know we have to celebrate every county, every community, we have to have more like a lot more dialogues about innovation. Imagine if you have a community where people are in, engaged, talk about libraries, you know, libraries about information sources and all the access, but they could be the innovation centers where people could get together and create new solutions. And we are, we are working with Illinois Parks and Equities Association to go to park districts, so every park district could be an opportunity to become an innovation center. If anybody wants to uh, talk about that, you'd be happy to do this. And again, make it made in USA again the best again. So how do you do this? So we have to, there are four step process. <clears throat> You know, we, I've been an entrepreneur and I've invested money, I've lost money, I've learned my lesson. One thing I learned, when people fail, next they will write books. So when I fail in 2000, in my dot com business, so well, what can you do? You have some extra time to start writing books. Not, it doesn't apply for you. <laughs> but it's really. So I ended up writing, I learned how to write books, I've done 12, 15 of them, a lot of the books written by now. I mastered that process. And <laughs> so the question is, how do you do this? One thing I learned, People focus so much on experts and like in business plans and all this stuff, nobody needs the crap. As an entrepreneur, I need to, need to create the solutions and just sell it. When I sell for half a million dollars, then I know those business guys are financial planners. Otherwise, I don't need them. In USA, to create a business, you have to be physically or legally create a corporation. You don't have to. They start making and selling, that's good enough. That's what you pay your taxes. So we have to simplify the process, his simplified process. In every community, we must first scout for opportunities. It's scout for opportunities. So we have to have very good dialogue and engagement of citizens that where are the problems, where are the opportunities, where are the challenges, and then create solutions. And that's what we do at IIT Chicago. IIT, I'm, I'm just so lucky that IIT has set up a center for innovation, science, and applications, which is the first in the world, and we are the major players in promoting science of innovation because we believe that it is a learning skill and we can teach anybody anywhere to learn. And then perfect it. Don't really be sloppy. If you're sloppy innovators, you cannot be successful. So you have to learn to perfect your solutions before you get to the market. And then sell. Just sell. Selling is the basic biggest skill. If all the help, if anybody can help you uh, in creating the process, help them selling their products and services. So it is really kind of call to call to action. We are community professionals to learn innovation methods to start a business about what they love to do. I teach at IIT, I teach at UIC. And, and a lot of presentations are on YouTube, you can search for those. But you know, it's amazing, every single brain, every single individual can create wonderful solutions. What I hear in the Britain, Chicago in 1871, my students do all the time. You can hear those presentations almost as good as anybody else. So we have to learn to teach people how to create new solutions and pursue their passion. All of us love something. This is the best time in the economy 
pursue your passion. Instead of looking for a job, you start a business because you have the opportunity. Revive the American entrepreneurship that we need so desperately, and America is known for entrepreneurship. So we have to really create a lot more in large numbers, and then use government funds to invest in American citizens to learn to innovate and start new businesses. It's not about infrastructure. We are building in roads and, 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 and the telephone, and the broadband and technologies. Unless we invest in citizens, how to use it, it's going to all be wasted. We have to learn to do this. And so this is a communication, community innovation model. We have civic innovations in education, in business, and in entrepreneurs. And of course, in government. What can government do? You know, every school cutting the budget, every government cutting the budget, where is the money going to come from? So innovation, education, we have developed, is available, and we will help anybody if you want to teach at some universities, we will help you develop the curriculum and teach at universities. And so for further information, if you want to, and learn about more what we can do. I know I have my colleague Marty uh, Borg here, and myself. Uh, we will be happy to talk to you about this. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. When you have no question, that means learn everything or know nothing. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, how do you do all this in your spare time? You are amazing. Keep working. Keep working, exactly, good. I'd like to invite uh, uh, John uh, Kadirsky from Illinois. Uh, he's the Illinois sales manager of Motorola with us, okay. Bill Cartwright, is Bill still with us? We're giving all these great people plugs, which is great. John, you're here, super, thank you, very good. And. Uh, and uh, Poonam um, Gupta Krishnan to come up and present the Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you. and uh, invite our second panel to come forward uh, that's going to be talking about community development through citizen engagement. And I'd like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Scott Propp, to uh, come forward to lead our panel. Mr. Propp is an innovation catalyst, a management consultant, and is the founder and managing partner of Dentro Consulting. His company's primary interest is the growth and renewal of enterprises, both public and private, through innovation. Prior to finding, founding Dentro, Mr. Propp served as Senior Director of Engineering and Technology for the Wireless Network Group at Motorola. In addition to consulting, Mr. Propp is a speaker and the author of The Growth Zone. You can find it on his website, and uh, more information is available um, in the session handbook. I'd also like to invite to our panel uh, Arnold Crater, who's the Chief Information Officer for the Regional Transit Authority. Marlon Burns, CTO of Cook County Health and Hospital System. And our panelist, who uh, is also... Uh, okay, good. Maria Healy. Yeah. And then also... Uh, for her second encore performance with PowerPoints that work, uh, not due to her uh, lack of technical capability, Maria Thompson, Director of Innovation Strategy for Motorola Solutions. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, boy, what a day. What a fantastic day. We started internationally with great vision. Uh, we built on that, we've come down to kind of the local level, and we're going to kind of drop down to about 15,000 feet now from 30,000 feet. And what I want to do with the panel that we've assembled here is spend some time at that intersection of legacy and future, and really talk about and kind of get our hands a little bit dirty around the ideas of how do we really engage and implement what, what it is we've been talking about. Um, my own background, you heard I was with Motorola for uh, a good bit. Um, the, the really signature thing that I do 
is pull together outside interests and research and development and then tie the whole business uh, lineage together to make those breakthrough projects happen. Um, I started my own consulting business around that now to begin to, uh, to bring that expertise to the outside world. And uh, in doing that, there's a remarkable thing that happens, and you kind of noticed it even here today, just by the richness of the folks that are here in terms of the diversity of background, academics, coming together to do interesting things. That is the juice that makes all this stuff really come together. So we're going to have an opportunity to explore that a little bit. Uh, the panelists, you've already met Maria, uh, so I won't uh, go any more in depth on her background. Um, Biff is a, uh, is, consults in the area of technology um, in terms of um, systems reliability and disaster recovery. And I'm going to use Biff in the role of helping us through technology change ways. And let's see if we can make our slide work here, yeah. So we're going to use this for a construct for today. I've really just built a simple three box model. And I think about this a little bit like a fraction. The numerator of this fraction is all about what we've been talking about in terms that we need to accomplish. And I'm going to say idea formation is a big part of engagement. And we're going to take Maria down to a little bit more in depth. She's run a hundred of these sessions and she's really good at stimulating good ideation which fundamentally is really important to engagement. There's nothing that's uh, more important than getting it right. One of my favorite things to say is big mistakes and projects are made in the first 15 minutes. Um, if you don't get that scope well put together, um, you, you have all kinds of trouble. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Arnold talk about implementation. Uh, he is um, the uh, CIO for the uh, Regional Transportation Authority as well as Deputy Director and will give us that specifics around the implementation piece. And then Biff, in, with his background in disaster recovery and cloud computing, will kind of anchor us in terms of inflection points. So the structure of the panel today, will have them give a brief um, background, a little bit of framework, and then we'll ask some questions of them. I've got some prepared questions. If the audience has those for a small enough and interesting enough group, we can go ahead and do that. Goal for this session, engagement. I'd like you all to have three to five new things written in your notebook before you leave, things that you can practically take away and do. Uh, that's really where we want to go here. So let me congratulate you all for the energy you're bringing at 4.30 in the afternoon. Thank you, much appreciated. And, uh, and, and let's see where this goes. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, have Maria uh, come up and walk us through a little bit more about ideation. Okay, so this is, this is my real hat. Um, I have worked at Motorola for over 21 years. I've worked with the Galvins and uh, absolutely love my job. Uh, what I do is something called directed innovation. And if you link up with me on LinkedIn, I've got several slides here that go into a lot more detail than we can afford to go into today. Um, but I recently gave a talk on predictive innovation at the back end of Innovation Conference, which is all about execution which is where actually we have issues because my process is so good at generating lots of ideas so we can filter and pick the right idea to execute on. But what happens is then you gotta go do it, right? <laughs> and as Praveen's pointing out, we're just doing it, but sometimes we aren't uh, firing or aiming before we fire. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's important and, and how you guys can use it even today. Uh, which one? methodology is based on making you park in the problem space longer. We hate that in the West. That is uncomfortable and every time someone says, oh, I have an idea, it's like we all start following them and we suffer from groupthink and it's like, well, that must be the best idea because it's the first one we came up with. Well, guess what? A ton of other people probably came up with that idea before you did and since I was parked in the patent department for many, many years, I, that was pretty much a sign of lack of novelty and I was always going for the novel solution. So this is a very, well, this is one of my favorite quotes, Einstein is a role model, um, but the formulation of a problem is often much more essential than the solution. You better be working on the right problem and you better park there and look at that problem from a lot of different angles. So you need to regard it from a new angle um, and with some creative imagination. And what that usually means is whoever identified the problem first, whoever comes up with it and says this is what we should work on, probably isn't the person that understands it the best and can back away from it and emotionally disconnect from it. And you need a team of people that do that and the surface assumptions 
surface constraints and limitations that you're building into your solution set as soon as you define the problem. So for today, um, one of the question banks that I use, and I learned this technique of question banking from Gerald Heyman in Chicago. If you, aren't, uh, if you don't know Gerald, he's a great guy. He's, he's at Solution People, he's solutionman.com. Um, reach out to him. But um, there's a, a Rudyard Kipling quote that, that he built this generic question bank on that I always use. I have everybody test their problem against it. And I have handouts usually at internal conferences that I have everybody have this in front of them. And when you're listening to someone, the way to make sure you're actively listening and learning from them is to ask yourself these five questions. So if you were to ask yourself these five questions about every presentation you heard today, who should know what you learned today? At least one thing, who are you gonna go back and talk to about it? What ideas were the valuable ones, were the one right ones that apply to your situation the best? that you should go back because you probably are gonna be an information overload today, like I said before. Um, when are you gonna apply it? What's the context that you're gonna apply it in that it makes most sense to execute on the idea? Um, where, what's the venue? Is it in the forest district? Is it in the park or is it, uh, is, is it um, with the public safety firemen? Um, why are the ideas valuable or important? Ask yourself why five times typically. Um, people, people have built-in prejudices about what's a good idea and what's a bad idea, and the more experience you have, the older you get, the more degrees you get, the more jobs you've worked on in a specific domain, the less likely you are to realize that you have filtered out a lot of different opportunities and different solution paths to go down. So make sure that you aren't discounting something that is a valuable idea if you look at it a different way. How we share the ideas for maximum impact. Okay, if you go back and you write up a long email or you went to this conference and you send that out to a bunch of people, what's the likelihood that any of them are gonna read that or hit delete because they have 1,500 emails in their inbox like I do? Okay, so what's the question making methodology um, for any problem that you're working on? Think about what the different sources of questions are. Okay, in your organization, what are the stakeholders that care about that or that you need on your side to implement the solution, buy into the solution? Who, who's going to be impacted by it? We talked about some big projects this morning um, that take a lot of culture change, take a lot of engagement by a lot of people. So you gotta think that through. Um, and make sure that you're answering questions even as you're trying to solve the problem that the people that are gonna have to execute on it care about. Collect all those questions, organize them, and improve them. And what I mean by improving them, there's a whole slide share presentation on this on my uh, LinkedIn profile about how you can make your questions more open-ended, more, more thought-provoking, and more generic so that you can engage more diversity of thought. Because the more diversity of thought you engage, the better ideas you're gonna generate, the more cre creativity you're gonna generate, and you're more likely to come up with a really good idea. And then apply those questions, and that's what we do in my brainstorming sessions. They, they are very focused around problems with lots of open-ended, thought-provoking questions, and we generate solutions in pairs so that there's no group thing going on. Um, so some advanced questions for you to take away and ask yourself as you're listening. What do we know? What don't we know? A lot of people forget to ask themselves that question. We always assume, and maybe it's arrogance, maybe it's just that we're all so good at our work, but we always assume that we know everything there is to know about the problem. And what I find is very effective is to find the guy in your organization who says that'll never work. These people will never change. We'll never get them to do this. Make that person your best friend. Write down everything they say and turn that into a generic, thought-provoking, open-ended question and figure out how to build a solution to everything they don't, they don't think will work into your chosen uh, path. And who else do you know that knows what you don't know? Okay, so there's a lot of people in this room today that probably know that. How do we get to know what we don't know? What are all the different approaches, right? We've got the World Wide Web or the, the friends out there that uh, we can connect with very easily now. Okay? And begin to unpack those questions uh, that she just laid out, keep in mind that we have uh, I've seen that process work over and over and over again, and a good portion of the multiple billion dollar sale that we all experienced uh, was built on that IP base developed by that question system. So don't discount that as simplistic. It is really important 
to go deep in those questions. Um, so a little more about Arnold uh, before I bring him up. Um, he was uh, with Accenture and a senior manager. Uh, he also was a director of Motorola, at which point we uh, actually got to know one another a little bit. He has an MBA from Northwestern and uh, engineering degrees uh, as well. So if, uh, Arnold, if you would come up and join us and take us through a little bit of the journey that you're experiencing now uh, from, the, from the CIO's point of view. Side arrow on the ground control. Yeah, okay. Um, is Sam still here? He's not, right? I have a 17 year old and he's about to go to I have nine months before he can make school affordable. I need him to bring the train. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford it right now. Uh, I just hope I can get that. Uh, you know, one thing that I, um, you know, this is like actually a reunion for me because I, you know, I grew up at Motorola, you know, uh, eight US patents later. I'm sure Scott probably had like 30 or so, right? Um, and then, you know, started a company so I competed with most of these guys out here as an IT management sales company and then rejoining Motorola and then joining Accenture and then getting off the airplane and, uh, and you know, joining uh, the RTA. So, uh, so having said all that, my, my experience is really, um, and I'm talking a little bit about cloud computing, but I'm not. And what I want to talk about really is how um, and cloud computing, I don't really know what that means. It, I think it's just a cover for, you know, multi-sourcing or outsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, so the claim that I'm making is that uh, IT organizations have to transform because cloud computing or multi-source environment is here to stay. Mm -hmm. So IT has to transform or be put out of business. And since business units have the ability now to source their own services, which really makes service as the, the key, uh, now IT has to transition away from the capability-centric model, you know, networks, applications, the way that they're structured, and structure themselves around implementing services, or else you're done. You'll be, you'll be a glorified help desk. Uh, and I'm not talking about my organization, but I, actually I'm not talking about your organization. I'm going to just focus this on my organization and that it's, when I joined RTA in June, it was just a glorified help desk. The uh, IT operations have, were moved out into the business units because they had the money uh, and they were able to go and source and get the applications and the services that they need. So um, having to figure out how to fix that is sort of where this thought kind of came around. Um, Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, there we go. And so this isn't me or whatever, but um, <laughs> I'm sure it's somebody. Um, so basically, um, the CIOs are basically faced with, uh, I think, a tremendous issue right now because uh, you have to figure out how to remain relevant uh, in this world where you know. Multi-sourcing is a, is here to stay. You know, people are you know they can go and source and purchase applications. As a result, so, you know we have to figure out how to uh, develop infrastructures similar to those third-party providers that are providing those cloud services, where we're converging our networks and our servers uh, and our storage, and then providing the data that people need. And it's really about the data at the end of the day. So. Um, when I, and I still do this every day actually because I haven't changed, it's a huge cultural shift. Uh, pulling things away from the business units, pulling the budgets back in uh, to IT and so that you can manage these relationships. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but that, those are just some of the questions that uh, I think typical C CIOs are faced with in order to kind of move forward and to stay relevant. Now, in order to do that, and just to talk a little bit about the disruptive force uh, of cloud computing, uh, you know, the business landscape is changing, and IT, traditional IT organizations can't keep up. We're focused on routers, switches, and uh, you know, internet access, and nobody cares about that. At the end of the day, nobody cares. So, um, in IT, about 60, per, 60 to 80 percent of most IT budgets are spent on operations and maintaining sort of existing, you know, maintenance and support. Um, so when they come time for cost reductions, 
IT is usually looked at because we, you know, because they're focused on the wrong thing. So the claim that I'm making is that IT has to shift to, to providing value-added business services and repackaging the things that they currently provide into strategic service areas so that you can show, show back and then potentially charge back the business units, the value of the services that you provide, then they can clearly understand what it is you do. If you do that, if you don't do this, I, you, you pretty much don't, you'll just be a help desk. And I don't think any of us, um, when we woke up or decided to go on IT, thought we we're gonna, we gonna manage help desks and do trouble tickets. But that's pretty much what IT can relegate themselves to if they're not careful. So, um, and, this, the second item is, is a transformation into a, a service-centric model. Um, and by establishing uh, service as an economic um, unit of measure. Basically, you know, similar to, uh, you know, when a, when a corporation, there's only probably two reasons to reduce the IT budget, and that's is, you know, your company's going out of business, or you, you're losing, you know, tremendous amounts of money. Other than that, the IT budget should probably not be the one that's cut because most of your innovation and your future growth is somehow centered in technology. No matter what industry you're in, what, what vertical or horizontal, technology is still gonna be the root of, of you achieving your productivity in some form or fashion. Uh, however, since IT is spent spending most of its time, you know, configuring routers and, you know, and sort of a build to order model, uh, and that means, you know, I, the business organizations, as opposed to configure the order. So if you had a standardized infrastructure, and um, similar to one of your third party cloud uh, providers, um, when you place an order, they just configure an existing standardized infrastructure. Uh, so IT has to develop that same type of infrastructure internally, uh, such that you can provide internal uh, private cloud type services. Um, in terms of you know and certain virtualized virtual certain applications or implement BDI or things like that, but it's not really even about that. Um, it's about providing value-added services. Um, so these are just some of the the um, I guess the typical building blocks of services for that you can group services into IT and start to re-educate the pop the community on services that you currently provide. And then there's other ones, but. Or employee related services and those are things that you know obviously like cell phones things like that that we do independently and disparately but when you group them into services you can start to you can productize them and and communicate the value of those services to the business unit uh, application services uh, information services and infrastructure services um, and I, this is I mean I, I'm kind of passionate about this because it's just so important and you know I could just talk a little bit about the RTA and the organization that we had is that um, you know we had just about every functional discipline that you can imagine in an IT organization. However, the business units uh, had purchased Microsoft GP. Um, as a result, they, they brought in SharePoint when they did that. Uh, our planning organization had implemented GIS on another end, um, and they were going off and they had their own GIS programmers. Um, uh, you know, our accounting department implemented AD, a, uh, ADP. And so we have all of these, and no one's concerned about how we're gonna integrate all of this data in the back end. So we have all of these spare databases. I mean, it keeps consultants. I mean, we love this at Accenture because we know, <laughs> that, you know they're gonna need us, right? So uh, we have all of these spare databases, uh, and, and the business units basically say, okay, IT, you know, this is, what we purchased, we don't care what you do. We don't care how it integrates. That's your problem now. And IT is kind of stuck with trying to figure out figure, how to figure it out, but they really can't. It's too late. Um, and I don't know if that might be my last one. You got one more. Oh, I have one more. Okay. So um, just a, a current sort of a roadmap to um, moving towards a service-oriented architecture as, and, and then ultimately a business outcomes orientation. Uh, this is where I, I think most organizations are, and it's a reactive mode. You sit around and you wait for someone to call with a problem. So uh, in order for, IT has to migrate up these, uh, up this path in order to provide the value-added services that, that are required by the business. 
Uh, most of the other things that we talk about, people just don't care about. I mean, at the end of the day, they don't care about internet. They don't care until it's a problem. Right, as long as it's working. And, and actually, that's one thing that we, like when we were at Motorola in the 80s and 90s, we didn't even, I don't, we didn't even talk about technology. It was just what we used. And it, it, it never came up. It was just part of our way we did it, things. Um, so, I mean, it's, that, that was awesome, like, what we did. So that, that's all I have for, for you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you.